Pastor Rob, would you come and bring the word this morning? Thank you for being here. Let's welcome him. Well, it's an honor to be with you. Um, Shane had sent me a, an email ways back. I'm not an email guy, but I, I saw his and um, he said he was taking a sabbatical. And I thought of all the people in the world need a sabbatical, this is one of them. Um, I met Shane a couple of times and, uh, I, and I've followed him. I'm a prolific writer and he's just the tireless energy that man possesses and what he's done for the kingdom. And he sent me an email saying he was going on sabbatical. And I thought, if anyone needs rest, this guy does. And I, I, I crack up because his name's an oxymoron. <laughs> Shane Idol. Men, you know, it's not, there's no idol in that guy. It's like one speed, go. And I thought, if that guy's going to take a rest, I'm going to come and help. You know, and I, I, I'd be blessed to be with you guys. And uh, I met Morgan and, and your lovely family and Jeepers. And, um, not only does he do well at everything, but he married well and his kids are awesome. It's, 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 he knows what he's doing. I'm the pastor at Calvary Chapel in Thousand Oaks. I was the mayor of the city. I was mayor pro tem. Um, I was mayor pro tem when we went through that horrible shooting. We lost 12 of our, con or 12 of our young people. Two of them were my congregants. Uh, one was a young man who survived Iraq. Fallujah and uh, was shot by this gunman. He, he ran our special needs ministry. It was real tragic. I became mayor uh, like a week and a half after that shooting. I uh, officiated two of the funerals of the 12. We attended all of them. It was a really trying time. I love my community. April 3rd, which of last year was um, our Holy Week. It was the Saturday going into April 4th, which would have been Palm Sunday. And we celebrate communion, a sacrament in the Christian faith, the first Sunday of every month. And the governor said that we weren't allowed to do it because the church wasn't essential. Even if we followed CDC standards, we weren't allowed to practice communion. Abortion clinics were considered essential. Liquor stores were essential. Cannabis distributors were essential, but not the church. Well, um, the church is a bride of Christ, right? And I've been married 31 years to a really, really wonderful woman. And I'm a little out of shape, but I tell you what, I'm, I still got some gumption in me. You come and tell me my wife's not essential, you'll be picking up your teeth with your broken arm. <laughs> the church has been around thousands of years before Governor Mussolini was around. <laughs> and the church is gonna be around long after Governor Mussolini leaves this earth. Nobody tells God that his bride is non-essential. End of story. So we followed CDC guidelines and we were going to have communion. And what normally takes us for a church that holds 400 and something people, we had 10 chairs and followed CDC standards. Cleanest place. And the press came out because they said we're going to kill grandma and everybody else. Super spreader event. But to their credit, they said, you know, this is the cleanest place in Ventura County. It was amazing how they handled it. And we, and we, we stood out. And we, we honored and we did what was necessary and, and we were following those rules even though the governor said we were non-essential. We still practiced communion. It took us three and a half hours to do communion. But we did it because it's essential. And by the way, it made it across the country on the newspaper. We didn't put out a press release. They just figured it out themselves. Made it all the way to London. I knew at that point the council would have to censure me. I'd be on the front page of the paper. They, and... and the last thing our city needed was that kind of drama. So I, I resigned my seat that I'd worked hard to obtain. I'd won re-election. And I, I, I love that seat. I knew I was going to win re-election again. I, I did well for that city. And I resigned that seat. Because I swore to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, when I took that oath of office. I was governing by the consent of the people who were the sovereign in America in accordance with the first three words of the preamble, we the people. And I govern by their consent, and I'm constrained as one who would govern by their consent. I'm constrained by the seven articles of the U.S. Constitution and the 27 amendments. And if I violate that, it is the right and the duty of the sovereign of the nation, we the people, to remove them from office. Now, I step down because I refuse to allow and work under the authority of a city that wouldn't recognize that that is a violation of the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. 
So that brings us to what happened next. All of a sudden, uh, the, the virus, we started to understand how it operates. We saw, you know, 90% of the victims were 60 and older with comorbidities and 85% of the people who contract the virus didn't even know they had it. And we started to see that, you know, all these different aspects of it. And we started doing live streams in the evening to educate our congregation, especially the folks that were older and were shut in. And we broadcast an FM station in our parking lot, but we opened the church for folks who wanted to come. And listen, I'm not the mask police. I'm not the mask police and I'm not the social distancing police. There's a little thing in this country we like to call freedom, and, and it's personal responsibility, and so here we are. <clears throat> but, but, it's a pandemic. And so, we start to look into this idea of what a pandemic is. Looking at history in the pandemic. And by the way, the nation was founded um, during a pandemic. Did you know that? Smallpox? They had a pandemic going. And the British were immune to it, but the Continental Forces weren't. And so they exposed themselves willingly and their families, and they were expecting a 5% death rate. And they did it not to preserve liberty. They did it for the opportunity just to fight to obtain liberty. And we have liberty, and we're surrendering it to a virus that has a 99.5% survival rate. And we're rolling over and saying, take it. Take it. And the biggest culprit is the church. You know, I made that stand, and not a single church in Ventura County stood with us. Not one. And they, they started to call us super spreaders. We've been wide open since May 31st. And you know when we went wide open is when they had the <clears throat> Black Lives Matter, well, I, I don't even like to say that, like say BLM Incorporated, riots in downtown Los Angeles, where 75% of the businesses that were burned and looted were Jewish-owned, targeted, by the way. And the governor praised them, shoulder to shoulder, no mask, praised them, lauded them. I realized at that moment, this is, a, this is a control issue, I'm done. And May 31st, we opened wide. Not a single case of COVID from our church. And then we get into August, and the county board of supervisors, three of the five, decide they want to make an example of us. And I'd been a councilman, I knew all the supervisors, I served with them, I went to all the funerals with them during the shooting. And I, I said, I pleaded with him. I said, look, we just, just leave us alone. But if you, if you come after us, we're going to go national. And I'm, I'm begging you not to do it. Well, there's no authority to them higher than government. So they wanted to make an example of us. How dare you disobey us? And so they get a predictive, politically predictive judge, and they put it forward an emergency temporary restraining order to shut our church. And I'm like, really? It's an emergency? I mean, we've been up wide open since May 31st on a single case. Now we're in August. What's the emergency? And they put it forward, no evidence, and they tell us that we have to shut down, and they want to get the police to enforce it. And by the way, I know this is like Thousand Oaks. We have a lot of retired officers. Uh, that, that oath of office matters. <clears throat> There's a reason why you swear to defend that Constitution, because you're bound by it. And it's, it's the doctrine of the lesser magistrate that if they're going to disobey it, even though you're lower on the food chain, you, you still you push back. Because you're accountable to God. And you need to do what's right. And, and, that's, and everyone, it's just a thousand surrenders which causes us to lose our liberty. You know, walking into a store with a mask on, they, you know, not with, without a mask, they say put a mask on and you, you succumb to it. A thousand little ways to just lose it overnight. And so... They tried to shut us down and they said, we're going to find 1,000 what they call does, either congregants or visitors to your church. And they also cited me in the case and they were going to arrest me. So we violate the restraining order. And that's Sunday when I come to church. You know what happened? Churches from all over California and other states surrounded us with 1,000 people on the outside. And they said, we'll take the citation. You guys worship in peace. <laughs> Big encouragement from Shane. What a blessing. And, 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 and I, would, I would say that the sadness was the local churches decided not to open. They yielded. They yielded. I want to educate you on the most 
misunderstood, misapplied passage that is destroying our country right now. When we opened, our church grew 400% in five months. We don't know what to do with the people. And I used to have a gift of preaching a church down to a manageable size. I always used to say the largest church in the Conejo is the church of the people that used to go to our church. And if I haven't offended you, just give me an opportunity. I will. I, I have that gift. I think it's a spiritual gift, really. I, um, I'm what's called the political pastor. It seems to be an anathema in our country. You don't, I don't, we don't do politics. I travel the country and I speak to pastors. They say, we don't do politics. Politics is dirty. And I always say, well, so is the church. What's your point? I say, you know, 2 Timothy, the pastoral epistle. He says, pray for kings and those in authority that we would live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and reverence. I say, pastor, that's a pastoral epistle. It's a word of God. Amen. Can you name your five city council members and your five school board members that you pray for by name and the issues that they're dealing with? That will allow your community to live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and reverence. You can hear a pin drop. We want our we we want our salvation to come on Air Force One. We don't understand what happened. I bought a pillow and I watched Fox News. What what happened? <laughs> I'll, t- I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you what happened. That's federal, and that's the swamp. Everything flows downstream. That's why they call it a swamp. Sacramento is geographically a swamp, but figuratively it's a swamp. Same with Washington. It's a swamp. And if you want to change the swamp, you got to go upstream. And you know what upstream is? It's local. It's the school boards. And today's council member is tomorrow's congress member. Well, I don't want to sit in a school board meeting. They're boring. You're darn right they're boring. And they're critical. And as Christians, we've abandoned the public square. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, he says, Upon this rock... I will build my, no, ecclesia. Church came 400 years later. Church is what King James put in to control the hierarchy. The word is, is, is a secular term that Jesus co-opted. It. He didn't say synagogue. He didn't say temple. He didn't use a religious term. He did deliberately used a secular term. He said, upon this rock, he's talking to Peter. He says, upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia, which means public square. They existed hundreds of years before Jesus spoke. It was the Greek culture where the citizens would gather to decide the political future of their community. And above the door of every ecclesia was two words, isonomia and eleutheria, liberty and equality. I wonder where our founders got that. And over 50 years ago, we decided to abdicate the public square. And we decided to do church, buildings, budgets, and baptisms. We're impressing ourselves. While we've been doing church for 50 years, the secular progressive left has been dominating the ecclesia. We wonder what happened. We've educated our people that we don't do politics. Even though Aristotle said politics is the highest form of community because it combines morality and sociability. How do you live together? And everybody, everybody is political. It's political in your home. I remember when I was running for office and the Republican candidate who was in the primary told me, you shouldn't do this. You should step out. I'm the better candidate. I said, yeah, no doubt you're the better candidate. I'm just running because I want my people to get involved. I knew I was going to beat him. (laughs) I said, no, you're, you're the better candidate. And they said, you don't understand. Do you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm in politics. I'm, I'm holding office right now. Do you know what this will do to your family? And I looked at her and I said, Lady, I'm in ministry. (laughs) You don't know tough. (laughs) It's a rough world, but it's necessary. And we've abdicated our responsibility in that public square. We stepped away. And I want to take you to a verse that has caused that Because when I stood, you know what the pastors did? Uh, They were quoted in the newspapers decrying what I was doing. That I was in violation of God's word. And they quoted the most often quoted verse in Nazi Germany, by the way. Romans 13. Do you have it? Do you have your scriptures? 
Let's take the first slide, go to Romans 13, starting with verse 1, if we could, if we could jump to that slide. Thank you so much. This is their favorite verse to subject you, and they quote this ad nauseum. Gospel Coalition loves this verse. Pastor Coates in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, he's in prison. Gospel Coalition comes out and quotes this, stating he's in violation, he should be in prison. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? It says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to what? Okay. But to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good. And you will have praise from the same. And here we go. For he is God's minister to us for what? He's there for our good. He is a minister. He's God's minister. And he's there for our good. Right? I'm watching the Gospel Coalition berate Pastor Coates, who's in prison in Canada because he's preaching the gospel. And they're saying on the Gospel Coalition that he should be in submission to the Canadian government. Yeah, no, no. I don't know where you get that, but it uh, doesn't work. He's one of the bravest men I know. They, they actually have him in solitary confinement. And you say, well, that won't happen in America. Just take a look. Just take a look at their constitutional layout and what they say about religious liberty. It is almost verbatim the First Amendment of the American Constitution. And they're doing that in Canada. And they're not going to do that here. Really? All I know is I'm getting fined every Sunday for being open. I have the audacity to allow people to worship the living God. And that requires a fine? You see, no one stands in the way of that. No governor. So the Bible says, in Ephesians 5 and 6, it says, Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Children, obey your parents. It'll go well with you. You'll live long on the earth. That's the hierarchy. That is the building block of all culture. And that is God's design. In the beginning, he made them male and female. The weakest of the four, you have God, husband, wife, children. The weakest of the four is the children. They have the most levels of protection. Women, no matter how you've been indoctrinated, I, when I was a junior in high school and I had uh, achieved uh, a nationally ranked time in swimming, I looked and there wasn't a woman on the planet who could swim faster than me in my event. That's not bragging. That's just reality. Men and women are biologically different. I know that's a shocker. I know it's a shocker, but just work with me here. And by the way, if you don't like the order, get your own universe. <laughs> and so, so they have two levels of protection, and the husband, God's protected. And, and so this is how God designs a family. Nurture. Grow up in the love and the admonition of the Lord. When a child is there, when you raise him in the love and the admonition of the Lord, he won't stray. And so you have that picture. Now, that being said... We're supposed to submit to one another in the fear of God. And then it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did, he, how did Jesus love the church? He died. He died. Oh, you mean like physical bullet? No. No, it's worse. It's ego. <laughs> it's a, it's, ego is self-preservation. It's, it's where men have to learn how to say, I was, <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was wrong. I'm so, 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 I'm sorry. Will you <laughs> forgive me? <clears throat> right? You, you look at men and they're, they, they've got to be bold. And, and you've got to be a warrior. You can't be afraid of stepping on toes. You go slay the dragon. And wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. I'll tell you, a really weak man is a man who has to say to his wife, wife, submit. That's pathetic. I'm going to pause for emphasis. You know why you have to say that? Because you have proven yourself unworthy of submission. You have, to, you have to demand it. And you're going to use your brawn and your anger. And you're going to put them on your thumb. That's not the scripture. That's not God. That's awful. You got a problem. You need to repent. A wife willingly submits. She does it as unto the Lord. And let me just add this, men. There isn't a man 
in the world worthy of a wife's submission? I'm just saying. Look around. Looks like the bar scene out of Star Wars. We all got issues. We put the fun in dysfunction. So, <laughs> acres and acres, and I'm all hers. <laughs> she married me, it was like bait and switch. And I was exercising, and I was an all American swimmer. And then she married, she says, Where do we want a honeymoon? I'm like, Golden Corral. <laughs> I hooked you. That's it. It's going. I got a furniture issue. My chest moved into my drawers. I got a washboard stomach. I just got laundry on it, baby. But the point is this. Wives, you're still called to submit to them. And the secret that women understand is you're not submitting to that flawed man. He's just not worthy of it. You're submitting to the Lord who is asking you to submit to that man. Because he's got work to do. Because men chase women until they catch them. Ponder that. <laughs> a man chases a woman until she catches him. And then she spends her entire married life making him civil. <laughs> and the children are watching this. And they're thinking, this is schizophrenic. <laughs> but God commands them to obey, and he gives them a promise. He says, look, I know it's crazy, but I'll make a promise. You obey them, you'll live long on the earth. Because if you can learn how to obey those people, <laughs> you'll be able to do anything. And you do learn that. You learn that blessing. And the family's built. Culture spends, as the secular progressive and the devil wants to destroy the family because that's the center building block of all culture. So the government will take care of the child. The government will take care of the mom. The government will take care of the grandparents. The government will even take care of the father, but they won't take care of the family. They'll do each of those independently to break them apart. They also want to destroy the identity of the family. There's not a husband and a wife. There's not two genders. And so they begin to infuse it with confusion because Satan is the author of confusion. And the other thing that they attempt to do is deconstruct. They can only deconstruct. God builds, mankind destroys. The law of entropy, everything reduces to its least common denominator, but the Lord operates in contrast to the law of entropy where he builds. And he does that by the family. And the family requires for, for survival, surrender. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. You have to yield. You have to lay down your life. And, and my sister, who is a left-leaning liberal lesbian, I told her, I said, for you to love another woman is easy. She goes, what? I said, just hear me out. I said, it's going to sound cruel. And we have the greatest relationship. I said, it's going to sound cruel. But it's the highest form of narcissism. She goes, what do you mean? I said, for you to love another woman is just, you understand a woman. I understand a guy. I mean, we can be in a room and guys are like, uh. and you know what we said? <laughs> nice haircut, thank you. <laughs> I mean, it, it, <laughs> things, it's just the way we communicate. We don't. And, and women are just perplexing. Whoa, why so many words? And they're all attached to emotion. Doesn't match my outfit. And the haircut is just, and so I was thinking, it's like, what? We don't get that. My wife, she just talks. I'm like, <laughs> don't pick it up. It's like, I'm, I'm, I, I, that's too many words, I'm full. And I told my sister, I go, I, for me to understand Michelle, I literally have to die. Because every word is connected to something deep. And I, I don't want to do that. I'm like, this is way too involved. 
There, there's minutia. I don't need it. I, I make decisions. I hunt. I don't shop. <laughs> what do you? And so you lay your life down, and in losing your life, you gain a whole new one. I said, what you love about someone of the same sex is what you love about yourself. And she goes, well, that's true, but there's still a certain... I said, no doubt, and I understand same-sex attraction. I understand how all that happened with, you know, mom and dad and the issues and divorce and identity. And, you know, we've created a monster. Now we decry its existence. I, I get all that. I said, but, you know, the Galatians 3 is the law as a school teacher. It's a guardian to point us to Christ until faith comes. And, you know, row in that direction and you'll come to know Christ one of these days. And, and I, I believe she has. She's still struggling. But, but my, my point is this, everybody wants to receive love and give love, we just don't know what it is. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for a friend. In Romans 13, when you see this, and they use this, they say, submit. God appoints all positions of authority and you will submit and do as you're told. And if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. That's like that man in his house who has to tell his wife to submit. He's out of control. And, and does a child submit to the father when the scripture says, children, obey your parents, it'll go well with you, you'll live long on the earth. When the father demands that that child does something like child prostitution as they do in Thailand. No. No. Get out of that mess as soon as possible. We have a safe house for you. That is not what God intended. That is an abuse of authority. That is a tyrant. And as a husband can be a tyrant in a home, and the wife can be complicit and the children would suffer, God doesn't tolerate that. He doesn't tolerate it in government either. And so a man by the name of Jonathan Mayhew, Jonathan Mayhew, he was a preacher. He died in 1766, 10 years before the Declaration of Independence would be signed. And he was a pretty amazing guy. He had a doctorate of divinity from Harvard. And he took Romans 13 and he created a sermon that transformed the American landscape and started the American Revolution. It was John Adams who said he was the most instrumental minister to bring about the American Revolution. And he had the audacity to look at Romans 13 and exegete it in a way that completely makes sense, but puts all of these pastors in America and also in Nazi Germany he puts them in a place of being wrong. Mayhew's sermon resulted in the motto for American Revolution, resistance to tyrants is, uh, is obedience to God. And his sermon, his sermon was real simple. He, he said in Romans 13, God appoints all positions of authority and that we're to submit to those. But then he goes on to say, but that authority is there for our good. And his statement and his conclusion, which was brought about by a man named John Locke, who was one of the Enlightenment thinkers, his conclusion was, if, if that man, if that leader is not doing good, they lose their right to be the authority. If the king is a tyrant, he loses his kingship. The problem is, pastors in our nation look at Romans 13 and they apply unlimited submission. And all the loyalists and the Tories in, in the British Empire and these ministers, they looked at themselves and they said, we are submitted to the king because divine right of kings, God appoints all positions of authority. And they use this as unlimited submission. John Locke said, our Savior's great rule that we should love our neighbors ourselves is such a fundamental truth of regulating human society that one might without difficulty determine in all cases, all cases social morality by that rule alone. And he understood love, and he understood serving one another, and he understood the opposite of that when a ruler is a tyrant. And so when that tyrant steps in and starts to rule in an ungodly manner, he declared it's our right and our responsibility to remove that tyrant. They no longer have the right to do what they're doing. This was 1766. This is long before we established the U.S. Constitution with the preamble that says, we the people. 
And now with We the People, it's real simple for pulpits in America. If they just did their civics homework, they weren't so stupid. And they opened up a book and they studied to show themselves approved. Whatever things are true, if they just looked at the first three words of that preamble, We the People, they would understand with Romans 13 who the authority is. The authority is us. And they govern by our consent. And when they step outside the boundaries of that constitution, it is our responsibility to push back against the tyrants. Because Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and enslave. And the law that churches have neglected, the law that's found in in Galatians 3, the law that's found throughout the book of Romans, the law was given to Moses because three to five million Jews were enslaved in Egypt and they cried out to God for deliverer. God sent Moses. He confronts Pharaoh and he says, God says, let my people go. Pharaoh says, who is God that I should obey him? Which is typical of every leader today. Moses says, Oy vey. You, you've opened up a can of Jesus. You're not going to get the lid on. Ten plagues. Egyptian army is drowned in the Red Sea. The people let them go and give all their prized possessions. The Israelites cross the Red Sea. They end up in the desert. God provides food every morning in manna. Provides water, quail, Their shoes don't wear out. Their clothes don't wear out. Miracle after miracle. Moses goes up on Mount Sinai. He gets a downloaded moral app. (laughs) The Decalogue. Four commandments, relationship with God. Next six, relationship with each other. He comes down the mountain with these four commandments and these six commandments. You can see the stations of the cross. Also coincides with Matthew 22 that we just read, two great commandments. He comes down the mountain and Israel is in debauchery. They've got a golden calf and they've got a rave party going on. (laughs) What are you doing? You're crazy. Stop it. And he does what God commanded. He puts, he teaches the children the moral law and places it in the center of the community. Now, Here's the greatest miracle of all the ones I just listed. Three to five million people lived together for 40 years without a police force or a standing army because they had moral law. Today, the church has abandoned moral law. We say, oh, we only have the law to show us we can't keep it. We're saved by grace through faith. And we've truncated the gospel and we've made it myopic to say that you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If you believe in your heart, confess with your tongue, Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. The glory of the Father, raise your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. And we're really into conversion making converts, but not disciples. And we don't study Levitical law. We, we, we don't look at the moral law leading into civil law. We don't understand what the Bible has to say about immigration. It has a lot to say. We don't understand what the Bible has to say about capitalism. It has a lot to say. We don't understand what the Bible has to say about socialism. It has a lot to say. It's in there. We just don't study it because the law, it's antiquated. We just want people to get saved. Brother, I preach the gospel. I don't do politics. I hear that all the time. Everybody does politics. What are you talking about? You do politics in your family. You do politics in every relationship you have. Politics is the highest form of community. That's what Aristotle said. It combines morality with sociability. You make decisions. How do you get along? You got to have agreements. Everybody does politics. Yeah, I'm talking about government. We just don't do government. We just, I just don't do politics. No, what you're saying is you're lazy and you're apathetic and you don't know how to do what Jesus said to push back the gates of hell. And so you have exchanged that word ecclesia for the word church. And while you've been doing buildings, budgets, and baptisms, the secular progressive left has been doing ecclesia. And all your children are indoctrinated. And they've all been lied to. And they have now allowed abortion to be mandated across the country where you take a little human being created in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made, knitted together in its mother's womb. Before you were born, I knew you. Jesus was in his mother's womb with his name, Jesus. He leapt in the womb when he came into contact contact with Jonathan, who was in the womb of his mother, and the two of them were there. They had names. They were babies. They weren't blobs of tissue. Yet we have allowed, while we've been doing church and they've been doing ecclesia, we've allowed a million babies a year to be ripped apart and flushed into the sewer systems of our nation. And we think we're righteous. 
And we're upset that we've lost our liberties. We're bummed about the president or whatever it is. We were hoping our salvation would come on Air Force One. We're like, I bought a pillow and I watch Fox News. What happened? (laughs) This is a wake-up call for the church. That's what happened. I saw your verse out there. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. You got to own it. I, I, can't, I can't believe that, that, they, that we, we swallow that. I go, no, 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 no. It's not socialism. It's democratic socialism. As though there's a difference, by the way, that's what Hitler called it. Socialism. You know what? Democratic socialism and socialism are the same thing. There's just a little difference. In 6,000 years of recorded history, they've all ended up in the ash heap of history because it's just another oligarchy. It ends up in a communism and a misery. But socialism, where the government controls everything, it's real simple. And democratic socialism is where you get to vote yourself into the socialism. So it's just, it's, it's, socialism is a dog turd. And democratic socialism is putting sprinkles on it. And there, there, there you go. It's like... There's your socialism. And just I've succeeded in offending. One down. All right. I told you I had the gift. Pastors of the day who were loyal to the tyrant king were called royalists and loyalists. They taught unlimited submission and passive obedience in all cases, irrespective of how wicked the ruler was and how tyrannical his acts towards his subjects were. And that's where we are today. That's what all these pastors are saying. You need to submit. You have to submit because the government says we're supposed to do it. And that's what we have to do. You have to, you have to submit. And besides, it's easier for them to shut down your congregants businesses. If you just submit, you just got to submit. And it's easier when we just, you know, because there's unity and conformity. And, and so You know, not everyone could just be the same. And you're making it difficult because I really am enjoying preaching in my pajamas. And I don't really want to go see people. Watching church on the internet is like watching a fireplace. It's like you can see it and you can hear it, but you can't feel it. There's no warmth. Yeah, and Jesus says, do not forsake fellowshipping with the saints. I don't know what other verse pastors need other than that. Jesus said to one of the lawyers who was trying to trip him up, the lawyer said, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Heart, soul, strength, and mind. And he says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he adds this. He says, on these two commandments, hang all the law of the prophets. You get that down, you you got it all. Love God, love each other. Downloaded moral app. Moral law. Love God, love each other. Decalogue. And then out of that moral law comes civil law. Scripture speaks on what we're supposed to do with immigration and capitalism. And it's all laid out in there, but we just don't study it anymore. Pastors go, oh, I don't teach the law. The law is only there to show us that we need Christ and that we're saved by grace through faith. And the law only points out that we can't keep the law. Wrong. The law is the wise restraints that make men free. You apply restraints towards evil in order to pursue excellence. Anyone who's ever participated in sports knows that. Reason why Patrick Mahomes and and, uh, Brady... You know, they're out there just performing and taking football and enjoying it at a level of excellence all of us will never enjoy. Because why they're out there studying game films and practicing and, and, and analyzing everything and putting hours in. We watch the football game in our Barca lounger with a big round bowl of potato chips and a large Coke while our bellies are getting bigger. And we're doing the, you know, armchair quarterbacking, telling them what they should do. You'll never play in the NFL. You're pathetic. They're there because they applied restraints. You didn't. You were just eating the chips. You're just eating the chips. You're just eating them. But you want to tell them how to do it. Because you know. You apply restraints. You pursue excellence. And if that authority does not allow you to experience the a mago day and the excellence for what God created. America has, been given us, America has given us freedom. 
We've been created in the image of God. And the only restraints we have is if we honor God and we honor each other, you're free. And, and, and anyone who governs by our consent is bound by these articles. And, and the rest is, it's you and God. And if anyone infringes on, on that relationship, shut them down. And the Lord says, oh, no one en- anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love those. Uh, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And you say, well, pastor, then you are a super spreader and you're doing harm to your neighbor. Okay. How is that? Because we've been tracking the science. And, and every time there's a contradiction, they just censor us. They take us off YouTube. There's 50,000 doctors who signed the Barrington Declaration, and they're gone. Anyone who stood with the frontline doctors, gone. The censorship is, is unprecedented in the history of our country. And why would they censor? I, ha- I have news for you. There's not anything on this earth I'm afraid of that anyone can say. You can yell at my face, call me all kinds of names or words. It doesn't even faze me. But why would someone censor someone else? Because the truth is not afraid of a lie. It will always win. But a lie is always afraid of the truth. That's why they censor. And I got news for the young people. You want to be rebels? Anything they censor, go find it. Because that's true. That's, that's how you figure it out. We're not endangering our congregants. We have tracked this. We've had more than 20 doctors on our live stream. We've gone through the data. We've explored it. We've looked at it. As a matter of fact, I'm I'm almost certain our congregation has heard immunity. And they were saying we're killing everybody. Just not true. None of it has added up. None of their projections have added up. We have one five hundredth of one percent death rate in Ventura County. And they've devastated everything. They've lied to us. And, 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 and with that, they think it's justification to shut down an inalienable right. It doesn't work that way. You see, the scripture says that we will love our neighbors ourselves. And love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love your neighbor as yourself. We really love ourselves. You're like, no, I don't, I don't love me, Pastor. I hate me. I hate me. I, you do? Yes. I hate myself. Why? Because I'm ugly. You hate yourself because you're ugly? Yes, I, I do. I go, no, you don't. Why do you say that? Because I hate myself. Well, if you really hated yourself, you'd be happy you were ugly. Let's think about it. Really, what you're saying is, will you tell me that I'm beautiful? Because I want to know, I want to hear more things about me. And that's kind of the way I get around that. Is I say I'm ugly and I hate myself, and then people tell me that I look good and I feel better. Because I need some of that in my veins. It's about me. We're selfish. You're like, I'm not selfish. I'm the most humble person I know. You do a family photo. That family photo is good based on one thing. (laughs) How well you look. Everyone else could just be like, and you're like, take it out. That's awful. Oh my God. This is the worst. We love ourselves. We're always thinking about ourselves. Right now, some of you are thinking, he insulted me. I don't even know you. I don't even think about you. I'm too busy thinking about me. (laughs) Me. It's all about me. And 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 the issue is this. We we love our neighbor as ourselves. That means we lay it on the line. We fight for him. We endeavor. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He he calls us friends. Not that we love God, but that he first loved us. He endured the Via Dolorosa. He He endured the most heinous, evil invention 
ever devised by man to slowly kill a human being in the greatest amount of pain. And he had you on his mind. And you say, well, I just don't really think I need to endure. You know why you endure for your neighbor? To set them free. They're enslaved. You want to love your neighbor? Set them free. Christ has come that you would know the truth and the truth would set you free. Christ has come to set the captives free. The law was given to give us freedom. Engage in your community. Stand for what is true. Don't yield to unlimited submission because it's, it's like a twig on the banks of a mighty river that you go with the flow and no one ever gives you any grief. I'll tell you what I love about Pastor Shane. That man is fearless. Spine of steel. He doesn't care what anyone thinks. His concern is to set you free. He's going to say the things that a government that wants to enslave you doesn't want anyone to hear. There's only two genders. Oh my goodness, shocking. And yet churches figure out some way to tap dance. It's not a blob of tissue, it's a human being. And we're ripping a million of them apart in their mother's womb and flushing their parts into the sewage systems of our nation. It's called murder. You don't like it. What about them? I don't think they like it. But we don't talk about that. That doesn't fill a church. I'm not here to fill a church. I told you that. I preach churches down to manageable sizes. <laughs> I'm here to awaken people that they've been created in the image of God and they're free and no man will enslave them or eviscerate their children or call it a blob of tissue when it's being created in the image of God. When Jesus was in the womb, they didn't call him a blob. It was Jesus and Jonathan and they leapt in the womb of their mother. And before you were born, I knew you and you've been fearfully and wonderfully made, knitted together in your mother's womb. And you don't like it, but I love you. That's why I'm telling you this. You want the church to awaken? You, you want political change? You think God can bless America when we eviscerate a million babies a year? We can't. It's not pleasant. You don't like it. I don't either. But it's not about us. It's about our neighbor. The voiceless ones. The one that no one stands up for. We're the only place in America where you can schedule their death. And we allow them to exist in our community brought to you by Christians who don't care. And, and the churches, you stand in opposition to that and, and, and they somehow side with the government. And they use this verse in Romans 13. And they take it so out of context. You want to love your neighbor? It's going to cost you something. People want freedom. They want liberty. They just, don't, they just don't want to work for it. You go, I don't believe that, Pastor. Okay, three to five million people cry out to God for delivery. He sends Moses. Moses contends with Pharaoh. Pharaoh doubles the brick output and reduces the materials. And what do all the Jewish people do? They complain to Moses. Look what you did. We had a perfect life. We had leeks and garlic and all these things. Last time I checked, you were crying out to God. He sent, yeah, well, we don't want to mess things up. We don't want to lay our lives down. We don't want to sacrifice. You know how you love your neighbor? The same way a husband loves his wife, you lay your life down. It's not about you. It's not about your ego. It's not about your popularity. It's about standing for what's right. So when people know the truth, the truth will set them free. Well, that's not a blob of tissue, it's a baby. No, no, there's no, no, not over 100 genders, there's two. Oh, you bigot. No. I don't put a black tile up. Oh, you don't support black lives? No, black lives matter. Yeah, they do. All lives matter. Oh, you're a racist. Oh, well, you're into critical race theory. We can contend with that. But of course, you don't want to argue with us because you're not into debate. Oh, and by the way, if black lives really matter and BLM Incorporated really cared about black lives, why is it that Planned Parenthood supports BLM Inc.? And 70% of the abortions in America or 70% of the abortion clinics in America are in inner cities. And Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist who wanted to get rid of the inferior races. And, and I got to tell you, 13% of the population of America is black, and you cut that in half, six and a half, six and a half percent, male, female, the six and a half percent female, bring it to childbearing years, that's about 4% conservatively speaking. Almost 40% of the abortions in America are done by 4% of the population. It's a holocaust on the black community. 
They, they, there's no gas chambers. They, they, don't, they don't hang people. They have convinced them politically to destroy their own children. Oh, and they say, oh, you only care about babies when they're in the womb. You don't care about babies out of the womb, which is the biggest lie on the planet because no one adopts more than Christians. Nobody does foster parenting more than Christians. I've adopted. My family's foster parent. So give me a break. Whatever your argument is, a waste of time. And if you really cared about black lives, their birth rate is flatlined because you're allowing them to be eviscerated and flushed into the sewers of our nation. Of the million abortions in America, 370,000 a year are little black children. Number one killer of black Americans. Oh, but it's not a baby? Who told you that? Is that not a popular position? Churches will put up black tiles, but they won't stand for the unborn. You can't fill pulpits that way. or You can't fill seats that way. So you're telling me you love your neighbor and you would actually take that position of popularity? Well, um, we compromise so that more people can hear the gospel. What gospel? The gospel that makes no difference? The gospel of lies and compromise? Stand. Defend the unborn. Be a voice for the voiceless. Love your neighbors that don't have a voice. Stand for the least of these. If you want to be great in the king of God, be a servant of all. What you do unto, these, unto the least of these, you've done unto me. Love costs you something. End of story. <laughs> Jonathan Mayhew concluded this sermon that lit the eastern seaboard up. Let us all learn to be free, to be loyal. Let us not profess ourselves vassals to a lawless pleasure of any man on earth. But let us remember at the same time government is sacred and not to be trifled with. It is our happiness to live under the government of a prince who is satisfied with ruling according to the law as every other good prince will we will enjoy under the administration all the liberty that is proper and expedient for us it becomes us therefore to be contented and dutiful subjects to kings that are good and yet they wrote 27 reasons why they would break away from king george and they didn't do it for light and transient causes but i will tell you this I will contend with the tyranny of a governor who would declare an abortion clinic essential and the church non-essential. And I'm wondering where the other pastors in the country are. It's not popular, but it is truly love. And you contend on the, at the school board in the ecclesia for the lives of all the kids in the community. They're being indoctrinated with this garbage. And you go, well, the school board meetings are boring. Yeah, they are, but they're critical. So quit worrying about yourself and go serve them and, and deal with that. I sat through a six and a half hour meeting on the circumference of oak trees. You can handle a school board meeting. You love them. Yes? You love your neighbor? Then go contend for them. Contend for truth. Because truth will set them free. Contend at the school board. Contend at the council. Contend at every level. Give me the reasoning behind the mask. Show me the evidence. They don't have it. Contend. They get you by a thousand acts of submission to stupidity. And God is saying, stand upon truth. And you say, well, it's going to cost me. Amen. Greater love has no man than this and to lay down his life for a friend. And the people that you're serving aren't even going to appreciate it. Christ said, while they were yet sinners, I died for them. We spit on him, we mocked him, we cursed him, and he still, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You do it because you love them. And I'll, 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 this is the part I want to switch up. Last week was Valentine's Day. I fell on a Sunday. St. Valentine was a patron saint of uh, couples, beekeepers, engaged couples, epilepsy, fainting, greetings, happy marriage, love, lovers, plague, travelers, and young people. Quite a combo. He used to be on the Catholic calendar feast. They took him off in the 60s. And they, they, we, we still call one thing St. Patrick's Day because St. Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland. And then we no longer call it St. Valentine's Day. We call it Valentine's Day because we took the saint off. And the reason why is because uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, when he wrote Canterbury Tales, talked about St. Valentine's, the season of it where the birds made up and they find their mate. And that's where it became kind of a season of love. And that's where he covered it. 
And then in Victorian England, they started to send out these romantic prose that men could, could memorize. And they would go and they'd kind of woo the girl with their ability to speak lovely things because it mattered back then. Words did. They, they, would, they would court. And, and they didn't have the words to say, so they'd learn the English language. And these would be cheap written things. And they called them valentines. And, and, you know, just lovely poetic things like Cyrano de Bergerac. One guy would hide in the bush and the other guy who couldn't speak was getting the words. He's like, oh, you're so pretty, Dad, you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Your eyes are like a sunset. Your eyes are like a sunset. <laughs> I got this. You're finding a new set of snow tires. <laughs> and, 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 and men woo the heart of the woman. And, and, and the, the idea is... God, what you win someone with is what you win them to. You start to understand their mind and their heart. In our culture, we just go straight to the physical. And then you lose a baby or a loved one dies or you have a downturn, job loss, and, and now you spend the rest of your life trying to figure out who it is you're living with because the physical connected you and now you don't connect anywhere else. And it's devastating. Our culture has abandoned the courtship and and, and delving into truth and getting to know the soul and the heart of a human being. If we're going to love our neighbors ourselves, we need to understand what that love is. Greater love has no man than this and to lay down his life for a friend. It was Valentine's Day last Sunday. I had had an issue where I was... We were at my in-law's house. <laughs> and my wife asked me a question and I responded... And I couldn't hear her. I don't have very good hearing. I'm defending myself already. That's ego. <laughs> but my response, like, upset her. And I couldn't understand why she was upset. And she let me know why she was upset. And I didn't think it was justified. And I was going to hold my ground. And there's the line. I ain't moving. I'm not saying I'm sorry. <laughs> You're wrong. And it's like the, you know, it's like Barnabas and Paul, one insisted and the other was determined and not a small issue arose. And so we were, at, we were at odds. And she didn't talk to me. That's not like her. She was really hurt. I'm like, I don't get this. I was struggling, struggling. And then I have to go and do a funeral. And then I got to do services. And I'm empty. I'm thinking, what do I have to say to anybody? I've been married 31 years. And my wife's not talking to me. And it's her fault. <laughs> And I, I literally walked into church Sunday morning with no message. And I just opened up a box of old things that I was going through because we were clearing out of storage. And, and I, I had a picture. Can you bring up the picture of my folks? That's my mom and dad. And I looked at it. And my dad's looking at me and my mom's looking at me. And I, I felt like they were speaking to me. They both come to be with the Lord. And my dad's like, dude, you have no idea. And actually, he's looking at me, and, and I'm looking at him thinking, he's cocky, and he thinks he's got the world, you know, in, in his fingertips. You know, he's, he's, he's got it all going on. I got this lady, and she's smiling, going, he has no idea. <laughs> I'm going to civilize this man. And, and, and he went on to be a Navy captain, and my mother was an amazing captain's wife, officer's wife. They, they, they moved like 20 times. She always kept a clean house. She was a remarkable woman. They were married 55 years. And uh, they adored each other. Absolutely adored each other. And I was thinking to myself, they would sit down every night and they would talk. And I realized with my father that he always yielded to my mother. I thought, yeah, he's kind of weak. And I remember one time he had Alzheimer's and the, my mother, she... She could be very difficult. I'll pause for emphasis. And, and she'd given my wife a hard time. I said, that's it, we're out of here. I left. And my dad had Alzheimer's. He was running out going, don't leave like this. Resolve this. He was a peacemaker. And I go, Dad, you don't understand. I ended up resolving it with my mother. And I didn't talk to her for months. And this pastor comes in, his name's Marty Richter, and he, he says, you need to reconcile with your mother. I go, you, you're out of line. He's in his 80s. He said, I didn't ask you for any help. You get out. She, she dissed Michelle, and that's it. He goes, Rob, you don't want to live with regret. I go, I wouldn't even know what to say to her. 
He goes, you're a funny guy. Tell her a joke. And I'm like, whatever, Marty. And he comes in with a stack of jokes. He says, the funnier ones are on top, and it gets dumber down below. <laughs> I get to the second joke. I'm like, okay. I call my mother up. She's like, why are you calling? Oh, God. <laughs> to the moon, Alice. And I go, uh, I wanted to call and tell you a joke. What is it? And at the time, she's with my dad. My dad has Alzheimer's. I said, there was a man who had a memory problem, and he went to a, a clinic he, and, and, and to help with his memory. When he got back, his friend said, hey, how did it go? He says, it was an amazing program. He said, I, it just it was awesome. It was memory association. He goes, well, what was the name of the program? He says, what is that flower with the long stem and the thorns with the red he goes, a rose. He goes, yes, thank you. Hey, Rose, what was the name of the... <laughs> My mom started laughing. I said, Mom, I'm sorry. And she says, well, okay. Not like, I'm sorry to never get that out of her. And it was okay. And she, get, she laughed. Three weeks later, she was di diagnosed with lung cancer. She would ultimately die from it. And I, I went to go see her in the hospital. I walked in and I wasn't her son, I was her pastor, I could tell. She was looking forlorn out the window. And she looked over her shoulder and said, Rob, have I made a mistake having this surgery in my 80s? I said, Mom, it's the economy of God's grace. I mean, if the surgery works, you get extra years. If it doesn't, you get to see the finish line and finish well. She kind of resolves and says, okay. She was good. And I said, Mom, I said, Mom, what's, what's the thing you miss most about Dad since the disease? She says, his humor. He was the funniest man I ever knew. I said, he is. I mean, all the humor I have, I got from my dad. Funniest man I've ever known. And it stole it. But God would give you little blessings. My dad never wanted me to go in the ministry. And I was over at their house, and it was about a month before she'd be put, he'd be put in a home. And he was trying to cope with his Alzheimer's because his short-term memory was shot. And he knew the one thing I could do was take care of this woman. And so we were sitting down. It was a love seat. And, and I'm here, and my wife's next to me, and my mother's here, and my dad's over here. And my wife and my mother are talking, and I'm paying attention here. And my dad keeps getting up, and he comes in, and he brings my mother a blanket. It's summertime. And he goes over and he sits down. He gets up and he goes in, brings her a glass of water. And he sits down. He gets up, goes in, brings her a banana. And finally, my mother says, Roy, sit down. And I thought, you humiliate him. But she was actually protecting him from humiliating himself. And he sits down. And she's got all this stuff surrounding her that he's brought her. And I, I'm, I don't want to look at him. He's looking at me and I don't want to look at him. He was always upset I went into the ministry. He's looking at me. And if I look at him, it's going to fluster him. So I, I finally just look at him. He looks at me. He goes, what do you do? I said, I'm a minister. I'm a pastor of a church. You know, my son is a minister, and I'm very proud of him. Aww. You can learn things from a man with Alzheimer's. I learned how he loved my mother. I learned how he loved his family. He would take you on a tour of the house. On the right side of the wall were all of his accomplishments. Navy captain, president of the Chamber of Commerce, president of the Rotary, senior executive vice president, Silver Star, McCoy's Navy, Time Magazine, all the way down. Left side pictures of the family. He never, when he took you on a tour of the house, he'd take you on a tour of the house. When he's done, he'd take you on another tour of the house, take you on another tour. It was a coping measure. He never showed you the right side of the wall. He always showed you the family. 57 years. He loved that woman. He had the opportunity to become an admiral with one last duty call to go to Korea. Every officer wants to make flag rank. It was a done deal. My mother said, Roy, I just can't do it. I don't want to uproot the kids. And I just, I'm tired. My dad said, okay. He gave it up. I learned from them what it means to love your neighbor. 
lay your life down. And God gave me one last gift. I'm going to share it with you. My mother's dying. She's in the hospital. We weren't sure whether or not to bring dad in because he hadn't spoken and it would confuse him and we never took him out of the home. But we didn't want her to pass without him being able to at least see her even though he wouldn't recognize her. But the bond of love in the human heart when it is truly reflective of Christ laying his life down manifests itself in profound ways. My mother missed my dad's humor. My mother was dying. She's trying to hold it all together. She was placing blessings on everyone, and in comes dad. We had no idea what would happen. I want to show you a video I took. My dad doesn't speak, by the way. He starts kissing her mask. He backs up and he says, I love you. I love you. My mother says, Roy, I'm going to heaven. And my dad says, I'll raise you. I'll raise you. <laughs> and he says, I'm getting out of here. He couldn't speak anymore. He just. So my mom got to have the humor, got to kiss goodbye. And my dad said, with what was left of his mind, I want to get there and be ready for when you come. His whole life was about laying it down. To lay your life down means to do the hard thing. It means self-sacrifice. And you'll be ridiculed and you'll be mocked, but you don't quit because God has called you for this. The largest church in California wouldn't open their doors. And I wrote them a letter. And I said, why not? And they wrote me back. And I'll close with this. In their letter, they responded. They say, we are not a political church. We do take the safety of our members and community very seriously. And out of love and concern, we're not meeting in a large group for weekend services. They went on to say, we are open with our homeless ministries and our, our counseling ministries. But we, we care about our community and we take the safety of our members and the community very seriously. And out of love and concern, we're not meeting in a large church for weekend services, and we're not a political church. I responded. <laughs> I recognize the choice that your church made was out of love and concern, but you cannot say that you are not political. Politics is the highest form of community in that it combines morality and sociability. Those pastors who have chosen to fully open their churches deeply love their communities and congregants and are also very concerned for the health and safety of their communities, just like you. However, to say you are not political is not accurate. You have chosen to politically stand by your silence and submission with tyrannical officials who have ruined our economy, closed our schools, divided our people between essential and non-essential, and declared our churches as non-essential. You stated that your church has weathered the financial storm, but don't lose sight of the fact that these draconian actions by our state government have financially destroyed many other congregations and they will never reopen. You marched with BLM Inc., even though their actions resulted in innocent citizens losing everything they own, and 75% of the businesses in Los Angeles that were burned and looted were Jewish-owned and targeted. How can you say you're not political? The pastors that have opened their churches are maligned and ridiculed, and you have said nothing in their defense. And yet, in love and great concern for their communities, these churches stand against tyrannical gover a tyrannical government that has forced their neighbors' businesses into bankruptcy, forced the abused in their communities to be quarantined with their abusers, forced their elderly to die alone, all while these government officials have received full paychecks provided by your punished neighbors, whose taxes are the highest in the nation. These churches have been fined and shuttered, and yet you complicitly stand with these tyrannical politicians and their views and actions as being acceptable for a virus that isn't even calculated like every other virus in our nation's history. Instead, it is measured by who has contracted it. You are complicit with our governor who continues to trample small businesses of California with shifting impossible metrics 
to reopen, all while the state's homeless population and poverty rates now lead the entire country. Politically, your church consentingly and silently waits downstream to collect the human heartache they help create by complying to this government malfeasance. You are political even if you choose to think you are not. I didn't come for any other reason than to honor a man in a congregation who has shown an entire community how to love their neighbor. May God bless you and strengthen you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.